Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God, and it is he who made us. And we are his, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Good morning, Union Church. I want to begin this morning by reading Psalm 57 to you. This is what it says. Have mercy on me, my God, have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. I cry out to God most high, to God who vindicates me. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends forth his love and his faithfulness. I am in the midst of lions. I am forced to dwell among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They spread a net for my feet. I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my path but they have fallen into it themselves. My heart, O oh God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake my soul, awake harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O oh God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth.
Good morning and welcome to our online service this morning. The Bible says it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. And I pray and trust that today, as we gather together, your hearts are full of thanksgiving and gratitude as we come before the Lord. We're coming around God's Word and we're looking at Ephesians chapter 4. Today we're looking at verse 17 to 22. And I'd like to read those verses for you. I've entitled this message, Live Your Life Differently. So let's read together. With the Lord's authority, I say this. Live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts towards him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Today, I want to focus mainly on verse 17 through to verse 19. And we need to understand that Paul is making a very strong exhortation here to the church. The exhortation he is making is based on what he has said before. And so we've always got to take the context of what Paul is saying. Paul has said that we need to be grounded in the truth, that we need to believe, be believers who know the truth and are not ashamed of the truth of the gospel. He says we've got to be growing in the truth so we can become mature and healthy. He says that Christ needs to be the head of the body. And as he is the head of the body, we grow to full maturity. And then last week, we looked at the fact that we all have a part to play in the body of Christ. We're all ministers. We've all got to find our jigsaw puzzle that fits into place. And as we do that and we minister together, so we complement one another in the body of Christ. And we grow up to be healthy and strong. And it's on the basis of this that Paul goes on to make the next statement. And he says to us, with the Lord's authority, I say this to you. He's using this particular phrase just to say how very important the words he's going to speak now are to us and our lives. And he's saying to us, in a sense, yes, I am speaking with God's full authority. It made me uh, remember a time when our girls were younger and they would go out to play and Abigail had a watch at that point of time and she could tell the time. And so I'd tell her what time she needed to be home and uh, say, always say, bring Bethany along with you. One day Abigail got home and I said, where's Bethany? She said, well, Dad, I told her it was time to come home, but she said she still wanted to play. And I said, Abigail, you go to Bethany right now and you tell her that I said she better come home right now or she will be grounded. Abigail left and I can assure you that within minutes, Bethany was through the front door. Why? Because Abigail had spoken with my authority. She hadn't used her own authority to tell Bethany to come home. She had used my authority. And this is what Paul is doing here. Paul is saying, you can take these words as if they come from the Lord himself, and you better do that. And if you don't heed to these words, it's going to be disastrous for you, much more disastrous than just being grounded. So he's saying, listen up, church. Listen up. This is what I'm going to say. Live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. When Paul speaks of the Gentiles here, he's making reference to non-believers, those people who don't follow Jesus Christ. In other words, he's saying, don't live like the world lives. Live your life differently. Don't sin. You know, if we sometimes just understood how dangerous sin was, I think we would steer away from sin completely as the body of Christ. Sin kills. It's like a virus that destroys and kills. Now, we're all talking about COVID-19 and how dangerous COVID-19 is. And uh, people are doing everything they can do to make sure that they don't get COVID-19. They don't want to die. They don't want to get sick. And yet we know that already 11 crore people, or more than 11 crore people, have tested positive for COVID. More than 6 lakh people have died from COVID. It's a dangerous disease. People don't want to get it. Sin's far more dangerous. 
And how do you know you don't have the disease? Well, one of the ways that you can tell at this stage is if you don't have the symptoms of that disease. It doesn't ensure that you don't have it, but if you don't have the symptoms, then you probably don't have the disease. And I want to say it's similar in the church when we're looking at sin in the church. If you're not displaying the symptoms of sin, then you're living for God. You see, when we start to display the the symptoms of COVID virus, we've got to put ourselves in isolation for 14 days. If you wanted to get on an aircraft, you wouldn't be able to get on an aircraft because you've got to be isolated from everybody. It's a dangerous virus. And it's exactly the same with sin. And so Paul is saying, don't, and he he lists those symptoms of sin. And he says, don't act like the world. Don't behave like the world. Be different in the way that you're living. Stop living like the world. The Bible is written not just to be studied. It's written to be obeyed. And that's why in James 1, 22, we're exhorted. And you've heard me give this exhortation many times. Don't just be hearers of the word, but you need to be doers of the word as well. You know, we have many things in common with people in the world. We work at the same places. We go to school at the same places. We might have similar sort of jobs as those as people in the world. We might have similar t- family ties. But what we live for should be radically different because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And it all starts with the way we think. You might actually sit this morning and say, well, I'm not living like the Gentiles do. But it starts with something before that. It starts with the way we think. And that's why it's important for us to keep a constant check on our thought life. The company we spend time in will determine the way we think. The people that we spend hours with and listen to, that's going to determine how we think. And that's why the Bible encourages us not to spend our time in the company of perverse people, people who have got twisted morals and self-centered lives. We need to be different. We need to spend time with God's people. In Psalm 1 verse 1, the Bible tells us, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked and does not stand in the way of sinners and does not sit in the seat of mockers. What is it saying? In other words, don't spend time with the wicked, the sinful or the scornful because you will become like them. You will begin to think like them. We're also challenged very much in 1 Corinthians 15.33. It says, don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. I read the story this week of a little boy who was determined to make a sparrow uh, talk. And so he one day caught a sparrow and he knew what the answer was. He had three parrots and he thought the best way is for a bird to teach a bird to talk. And so he put the sparrow in with the parrots and uh, he, for a few days, got somebody else to feed the parrots and the sparrow because he wanted it to be a surprise when he walked in and he heard the sparrow speaking. A few days later, he went in to the room to check on the sparrow And to his dismay, the sparrow wasn't talking at all. But what he did have was three parrots who were chirping just like a sparrow. You see, we're affected by the company we spend time with. Paul is talking here, however. He is saying that we are not to be like the lost, like the godless. And what's so bad with the godless and the lost? Well, the first thing Paul says is it's their con- the condition of their minds. Verse 17 says they walk in the futility of their minds. Verse 18 says their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they've closed their minds and they've hardened their hearts against him. It's interesting when Paul is describing the non-believer here that he is not, first of all, talking about their actions. But what he first of of all speaks about is their thinking. And, you know, as Christians, that's exactly the place we need to go when we're looking at us being similar to the Gentiles. How are we thinking? 
we've got to ask ourselves some questions. Am I adopting the philosophies of this world? Am I holding to the value systems of this world? Am I working for the same goals that people work for in the world? Am I motivated by the same motivation? We've got to think about the way we as Christians are thinking. Criminals come from all different backgrounds in life, educated, uneducated, just the, the, the whole range. They're all from different backgrounds. But the link between them all is their thinking patterns. Background has very little to do with criminality. It's the way they think, and criminals think very similarly. Paul says that the thinking of the world is empty. We use that word futile, which means it never succeeds. They can't come up with the right answers. Their thinking will never lead them anywhere of internal value. Romans, 12, uh, Romans 1.22 expresses for us when, Paul is, uh, when the writer of Romans is speaking um, about the world. He says, they're professing to be wise, yet they became fools. Solomon went on a quest for the best in life. He had all the wealth and power to do that. And he tried to pursue every pleasure that came to mind. But in the end, we read in the book of Ecclesiastes, he said that such a life is vanity and grasping for the wind. Futile thinking. That's what Paul is saying about the thinking of the Gentiles. The second thing he says is their minds are full of darkness. They live in the dark. They have a darkened understanding. Now, all of you in Uti know what it's like when the power goes off. It's rather unpleasant when it's in the evening and we're thrown into complete darkness. As many of you will know, I don't always call, call, carry my cell phone around with me. And so if you don't have your mobile with you when the lights go out, it becomes quite a challenge because there's no torch. You've got to find candles and matches. And I go grappling in the dark, hitting things, knocking things over, because it's just difficult to get about in the darkness. Remember on one occasion I was staying at a family's home and uh, one evening I went to put on the kettle and as I put uh, the kettle on to boil some water, I got an electric shock. It threw me back about three meters and when I finally got up, I was trying to uh, find where different things were in the house and particularly because I didn't know the house, it was very confusing. I was stumbling over things I couldn't get anywhere. The bottom line is, it's much easier to live our lives out in the light, not in the dark. You know, a lost person has to come to conclusions. They have to discover answers for life with a darkened understanding. And that's why you will often hear some wild things coming out of the mouths of the ungodly. When we share our, self, our faith with someone who has a darkened heart and hasn't been enlightened, uh, often they'll treat us as if we're from another planet. Why? They're not in stupid or unintelligent, and it's not got anything to do with us. We're not sharing the message inadequately. They just need illumination. They need God to turn on the lights. And that's what we've got to do when we pray for uh, the ungodly. We've got to pray that God will illuminate their, ha their hearts. The third thing Paul says about the minds of the godless is that they are spiritually dead. Paul says this about the condition of their hearts. He says they have no sense of shame. They have hardened their hearts against God. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. They've made a choice to turn against God. They've hardened their hearts. For many people, it's not that they haven't heard the truth. It's that they've chosen to live against the truth. They've chosen to ignore it. They've hardened their hearts to the truth. In 1994, in the U.S., George and Tina Rollison decided to name their first daughter. And the name they gave to her was Atheist Evolution Rollison. They said that they were making a statement to Christians who always went to the Bible and used biblical names for their children. They wanted their daughter to be called Atheist Evolution. P. 
people who've hardened their hearts. They're ignoring the truth of the gospel of Jesus. The word for hard there in the Greek is porosis. And it's actually talking about a stone that is harder than marble. It also has in the, the, the connotation of this word is the fact that there is a loss of all sensation. And so what are the symptoms of a hardened heart? Well, some of the symptoms of a hardened heart are rejection. We reject the truth of God's word. We reject teaching and preaching in the church. Another uh, symptom of a hardened heart is being totally uncompassionate. And that is outlined in the story of the Good Samaritan, where the Levite and the priest walk past the wounded man, totally uncompassionate. Another uh, symptom of a hardened heart is an uncooperative spirit. And we've all dealt with people like that, even in the church, uncooperative spirit. The Pharisees were like that uh, about, uh, towards Jesus. They were uncooperative. They didn't like the things he did or the things he said, and they were going to make it difficult for him, come what may. And how does that play out in our lives when we've got a hardened heart? Well, people become calloused. They become past feeling. They're beyond shame. People are given, have given themselves over to sensuality, to impurity, and to greed. It's interesting when we say those three words, sensuality, impurity, and greed, because that's what the world uses to sell many products today. They're carried along by sin. This is the spirit of this age. Now, a quick reminder, Paul is telling us about the, the mindset of the non-believer, the Gentile. And he's saying to us, church, stop living like the lost world. So I want to ask you this morning, what's the condition of your heart? Does the thinking of the world affect you and affect the way you behave and conduct your life? Howard Hendricks was a popular teacher of God's word, taught in a seminary for many, many years. He always kept in touch with the the students who graduated from the seminary. And after some time, he began to keep a little black book and take note of the names of students who had gone into ministry. And after they went into ministry, they fell into sin, adultery, greed, whatever it was. They failed in ministry. This list got well over 100 names on it. And he used to go over this list and try and uh, decipher why these particular people, what was the common thread that made them fall? And then one day he realized all of these students really had an arrogant spirit. They were unteachable. They didn't want people to impose their opinions on them. They had their rights. They had embraced the spirit of the world. And as they embraced this thinking of the world, they began to behave and act like the world. And Paul's argument here is so strong. Do not live like the world with darkened hearts and shameful behavior. But then he goes on to make a second argument based on the truth of who Jesus is. And he says this. In verse 20, but that isn't what you learned about Jesus Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and you have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and the way of your former life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. We're going to look at those verses in a little bit more detail next week. But this is the challenge that Paul makes to us. We have to ask ourselves some very important questions. We've got to live according to the truth of Jesus. What does that mean? Well, it means one of the questions I've got to ask myself is, have I truly heard the voice of Jesus? As Paul says here, have you heard the voice of Jesus? Or have you just heard a lot about Jesus? Maybe you have a lot of information about him. But have, the Paul is asking, have you heard the message of the gospel, the call to salvation, and responded to that. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you just living as a religious person? 
embracing a lot of the uh, thinking and uh, the, the teaching of religious people. Is it that or are you actually living for him? Have you really been taught by Jesus Christ? Or are you feeding your mind with good, secular, maybe sometimes positive teaching? We've got to fill our minds not with what the world is giving us. We've got to fill our minds with God's word. We've got to imbibe biblical teaching. Have you really heard from Jesus? Are you listening to the truth of Jesus? You know, every single day we are feeding from many different tables. The world is giving us a lot of stuff all the way through the day. We're hearing it. It impacts us. But as we spend time with fellow believers, as we spend time in God's word, we are also hearing from God. There are many tables that we're learning from about life and eternity. And if you're living like the world, then you must be having a steady diet of worldly thoughts of worldly ideas, worldly philosophies. There are worldly members in the church, and they come in two ways. People who think they're saved, but really they're just religious. They haven't truly made a decision to follow and serve Jesus Christ. And then we've also got worldly Christians who, who are saved, but they're not growing. Have you noticed how much Paul talks about becoming mature and growing in God and growing full in love? They're not growing because they're following the ways of the world. And so let's heed Paul's challenge this morning. Don't live like the world. You know, the pri one of the primary purposes of the church in the world is that we are to bring the light of God to this dark world. Jesus is the light. We are here to be light and to lead people to light so that their darkness might be dispelled and their understanding might be enlightened so that they might know the life of God, so that they might know Jesus, who is the light of the world. The way we bring that light is by speaking the truth, unashamedly declaring the truth, but also living the gospel of Jesus. Biblical thinking will produce biblical behavior. I leave that challenge with you this morning. May God richly bless you and may you have a wonderful Sunday. This morning I spoke about no longer living like the Gentiles. Let's examine our hearts as we come around the table of the Lord this morning. Let's ask the Lord to do that for us this morning, to purify us as we come and share around the table. We're going to partake this morning. Let's take the bread and share it together in remembrance of what Jesus did for us, his broken body for us. Let's partake. And then we take the cup. Let's partake of the cup this morning. Thank Jesus for what he's done for us. Let's embrace the life that he has given us. We're encouraged to live no longer like the Gentiles. Let's be holy. Let's live for him. Let's sacrifice, let's dedicate our lives completely to him. The Lord bless you.